My name is Sean O'Kane. I'm your MC for this evening. So thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. I'm a marketing director at Cadence Design Systems. Uh, welcome to the uh, our speaker series, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the Cognitive Era Speaker Series, and our topic tonight: Energy Requirements and Challenges for IoT Autonomous Intelligence at the Edge. So once again, thank you for being here. So this series helps to unlock exciting possibilities and change the way we make decisions and interact with people to solve our biggest challenges. We want to thank San Jose State University for hosting our speaker series, uh, along with Jim Hogan and Emily Lane, Director of Development for the College of Science, uh, who makes this event happen very smoothly every month. She's amazing. So have, uh, I just want to throw this out. Have you thought about how much the world has changed in the last two decades? Just think about that. Think about the immense change that is happening right now and what's ahead for all of us. Technology is right now affecting every part of our lives. How we work, how we play, how we communicate, how we get from point A to point B, how we make a difference in the world. Technology is the catalyst for immense opportunities for everyone, everywhere. Imagine connecting billions of devices in just a few years. Things that control how we grow crops or how we deliver better health care and education. Things that revolutionize our global environment, our transportation and security. Things that give us not only smart homes, but smart cities. Technology that helps us understand how people and computers think, act, and learn. What is happening today is more profound than the Industrial Revolution at the turn of the century. I truly believe that. This level of change is happening everywhere um, in ways we really probably can't imagine. Um, so this series talks about how cognitive uh, science brings together methods and discoveries from neuroscience, psychology, linguistics, philosophy, data, and computer science. So what I'd like to do is start introducing our guest speakers for the evening. This gentleman, who is he's the co-founder and CEO of Agios, which fe features an exciting new technology that enables innovation on how we design, how they design and manage power, energy, and thermal characteristics of electronic devices. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Voyan Zivojnovic right here. We also have back uh, for a second time, he's a co-founder and CEO of Sonics Incorporated. Please welcome Drew Wingard. <laughs> this gentleman is the Vice President and Chief Strategist of Semiconductor Business Unit at ANSYS. Uh, please welcome Vic Kalkarni right here. <laughs> and our next speaker is the founder and CEO of Acacia. She is a high-tech engineering and marketing veteran with 19 plus years of experience at VMware, Sun Microsystems, and NEC Electronics. Please welcome Garima Fakum right here. And now we're gonna introduce the big guy. Um, right now, please join me in welcoming our moderator and host as he takes us through our, our speaker series of innovation that is transforming the lives of everyday people all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jim Hogan right here. Thanks. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for listening to our pitch tonight. Uh, you know, we started this journey on top of IR4 back in the fall. And we've had, I don't know, four or five events like this talking about the sort of targeted areas that we called out in the early pitch. And so tonight we're going to talk about energy. Energy is a tough one, right? Because you go from the edge where uh, you got to have 10 years of battery life, and you go to the, the cloud where Bitcoin is going to consume every calorie on Earth. And how do you manage that? And so our, and this is Boyan's line, but I like it so much I made it the title. 
got to do it every microjoule at a time. You just you count them up and you just save energy wherever you can. So, if all goes well, I'll see if I can keep this on track. Yeah, just to remind you, Industrial Revolution 4 -0, you know, it's actually 5 -0, but I couldn't really make 4 -0 work unless I had 1.0.0, so forgive me for that. But it really, you know, technology started out with the agrarian revolution 10,000 years ago. And through every success of one, it's changed technology for sure. It's changed culture and had an impact on people in a number of ways. So it's just not technology. It's also cultural norms. It's also the way people talk. It's, it's just everything. So we're going through one of those right now. We call it Industrial Revolution Forum. So if, in that first pitch in the fall, we highlighted areas of growth. Now, I'm in the venture community. I'm a guy that goes out and invests money. So for me, it's like where are the good places to go you know, look at investment. And so, uh, so you can see below, we talked about, about a few of these. Uh, next time, uh, when we do this in April, uh, we're going to have the provost, I believe, running a, a panel discussion around what do we do about the cognitive era and or specifically education. But tonight we're going to deal with energy, 15% growth. And the growth comes in a lot of different ways. So I'm going to spend a minute or two just talking about the real macro, and then we're going to dive down. Uh, Wayne's going to talk about his work, uh, specifically with the California Energy Commission, on what they're doing. Uh, then Drew's going to talk, talk a little bit about uh, what you do in the you know, microcontroller world, microprocessor world, to ensure that you're not using a lot of energy. Vic's got uh, a big role in a simulation company called ANSYS. ANSYS is going to be part of the solution for sure in terms of figuring this stuff out. And Garmina has got uh, the cloud. And the cloud's uh, going to be a place where everybody's going to do computation. If Amazon doesn't have everybody today, they will next week, I think. And um, what's that, how's that going to affect us? And what's their energy profile look like? So let's thumb through a few of these things. OK, hopefully you can see that slide. It looks like the color's getting washed out a little bit. Slide on the right, everybody's seen. It's the um, carbon footprint that's happening. And you can see right around the Industrial Revolution, the steam age, that started going up. The, the IR2030, the Pony 40, contributing a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. We can argue all night long whether that carbon is doing climate change, but certainly it's having some kind of effect. <laughs> now, let's look at the thing on the left, because that's going to kind of, uh, that's sort of the manifestation of a lot of things we, we're going to talk about tonight. If you look at energy consumption, it's actually going flat in uh, the domestic area. In other words, this, the power used, excuse me, energy that you use at home is gone flat. So if you look at those across all the households in the world, it's actually going down. So that's great. Transportation, you know, cars specifically, energy is going down. Everybody knows about electrical vehicles. We'll talk about that a little bit. What's really driving the, the energy consumption? And it's industry. So think about the manufacturing companies. One of the one of the issues I think we have as a country is we don't have a policy around that. Uh, China is certainly a large manufacturing company, consumes a lot of country that consumes a lot of energy, and it's having an impact. However, in the absence of the U.S. leading those talks, China's going to set the agenda. So we may get around to talking about that today. Oh, continuing on this, uh, let's see, during the fuel, so how are renewable energy sources doing? Well, it depends on the state, and so we're, we're going to talk specifically about California a lot today, but uh, renewable energy is getting more and more a part of the solution versus fossil fuels. In different parts of the country, uh, there's still things like coal, for example, in the northeast that people use. Uh, fossil fuels are still used in the Rust Belt quite a bit. But out here, and in uh, states that have a lot of sun, solar is working really well. And of course, wind's a big thing. So this talks about uh, the, the cost of a kilowatt of energy. So this is something that happened about a year ago, a year and a half ago in California. The price of a kilowatt uh, by renewable energy became cheaper than fossil fuels. That's a big, big deal. Right? That says the technology that was deployed was able to bring energy down to a point where it's more viable to have a solar or wind or, or, or natural gas also help because that became prevalent in the oil, the oil uh, boom that we've had over the last five years. 
And so it's a good time to really embrace uh, the renewable energy. Okay, hopefully you can see these things. But you can see on the far left, uh, my left, your far left, is uh, the United States as a whole. And you can see things like coal and fossil fuels are pretty prevalent. Uh, the middle one is California. Yeah, the middle one is California. And you can see renewable uh, energy, specifically solar, is starting to take a bigger and bigger bite out of it. And finally, on the right, I thought I'd throw this in. It's interesting what's happening in Texas. Uh, Texas wind is the prevalent um, energy, renewable energy source. It's also interesting that Texas politically has its own power grid. Because Texas is, you know, just barely in the union, I think. You know, they still think of themselves as a different country. Well, they got their own power grid, and they power it with wind increasingly. Okay, so let's, another thing we'll talk about today is prevalence of people in transportation relying more and more on uh, electrically powered cars in total. And the numbers are that about 2020, you know, probably with the advent of the you know, Tesla 3, if that ever actually hits the streets, uh, we're going to see a lot of people make it over to start using the total electrical vehicles. And everybody considers that the, the cusp of the curve where it really starts accelerating. Now, the outcome of that is the batteries are going to increasingly be a place where we have to, where as an investor and technologist, I'm going to look at batteries as a technology. We'll talk about that a little bit too. So while we're on the subject of batteries, there's a map up on top. Uh, if, if you guys aren't familiar with that, that's that, that intersection there is Rio in Nevada, right? So if it, you can see the picture of what this factory looks like. You look at the surrounding area around the factory, it's just rock, it's desert, there's not a living thing in there, pretty much. And so that's the Tesla data factory, the public data factory. And that's the largest building in the U.S. right now. And they're going to build five of them in Sparks, Nevada. So what does that mean in terms of people? Well, that's going to, that current site, with just one building, employs 6,000 people. Now, I don't know where they're going to get all the water and Sparks to, to, you know, for people to take baths and things. But, you know, um, uh, it's so technology and renewable energy is a huge boom, and they're going to store the energy. So Elon might not be making money off the cars. He's going to make a lot of money off the, the batteries. The inside of the factory, uh, people get in it. You know, that's what it looks like. Uh, it's just a huge place with, you know, with automation in it, and um, they won't let you take a picture. So I can't tell you where I got the picture. But uh, they're really concerned about these steel their trade secrets. <laughs> Boyan is a, a quick comment about Boyan. I, I've known him for a long time. We've been in a few ventures together. And Gios is, a, a, well, I thought it was a good idea. You know, and, and, and we got it going, I don't know, five years now? Yeah, something like that. So it would be great to hear from him and let him talk a little bit about what's going on in terms of using, uh, managing power for, uh, excuse me, managing uh, software to ensure power is uh, not overwhelming. Go ahead. I need to say. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Okay, so as Jim said, probably the five years of our work are these five slides here, but uh, just squeeze all together. Um, I will be talking about two notions which people pretty much don't relate that often, and that's macro and microenergy. So macro is PG&Es, and microenergy is the little bit warm phone when you feel when your game is starting. So how is this two related? And it's very much related, because you will see that in the next slide. Um, in U.S. homes, the energy consumption is going through quite a change, you know, where previously we spent a lot of uh, energy on uh, cooling, heating, light in special. Now there is this category of miscellaneous electric loads, which is, as you see in these slides, is taking a substantial portion of the energy. Uh, this is a little bit more, you know, involved explanation, but you will see that this is the stock what is currently in our homes than what Energy Star would expect to be in our homes in terms of devices. Then there is some emerging technology expectation and so on. So when we apply all these tricks, we will be having the miscellaneous electrical lo load melts as a dominant part in, in our homes and offices. And if you look, what are these melts? These are the computers. These are the set-top boxes, the TVs, 
um, three, four, five chargers you have in your home, maybe even more for tablets and so on, it accumulates to quite a significant level of power consumption. You also can see what currently we are doing in terms of voluntary uh, regulation. This is the Energy Star. Energy Star is not uh, mandatory uh, regulation that you cannot sell a product if it doesn't meet certain requirements. It just, you know, you will have an Energy Label, Energy Star label, and the product will have some better um, appeal to customers. You will see that some of those are regulated. Uh, some of them are just in preparation. Most of them have this Energy Star logo. Now, we are here talking about efficiency because, yes, in California we can produce a lot of solar energy, but ultimately we'll need to be aware that we need to save energy. Here's an example. Once we switch to 4K television and move to UHD television sets, NRDC is saying that we will be spending $1 billion more in billing costs to us in, in, uh, in the country, and that amounts to three San Francisco's in power, which is additionally going to be needed just to move from 1080p to uh, this, this new television set. So to respond to these challenges, California Energy Commission has just announced regulation on computers, which effectively is the first regulation in the country on computers. There are Energy Star voluntary agreements, but no regulations. So starting 2019-2020, no company will be able to sell computers in California, which are not complying to this minimum efficiency standards. Um, my company, myself, we contributed to that process, and um, this expandability score was not easy to generate, which now kind of classifies computers and devices in different categories, so that if a computer has a lot of potential for expansion, a lot of disk drives, a lot of additional stuff you want to connect to it, USB interfaces, HDMI, and so on, then you get a different score, but still this, as every regulation, is a, is a stick. And obviously industry doesn't like it. However, the expected benefits are huge. It, the potential for, for uh, saving, uh, uh, you know, a massive amount of energy are there if we just cut the energy consumption of computers and monitors by 30%. Again, this is a, a slide which came out uh, from NRDC around the announcement of this new regulation. Now, my heart lies in the fact that mobile and these plug devices, they consume different amount of energy. My phone runs for 24 hours easy and I have same resolution as on my PC and I'm just a fraction of the power consumed by my PC, which is warmer, which is louder because it has to cool and so on. So with the help of California Energy Commission, we have launched a project which is the mobile efficiency for plug load devices. And in this project, we developed um, the other side, the carrot for the industry, saying, hey, don't, you know, you don't like the stick, here's the carrot. We are defining for you the new power management methodology so that every manufacturer can produce more energy efficient devices. And basically, all these microjoules we save in individual circuits sum up to big savings if you multiply that by the 90 million set of boxes in the country or 65 or 70 million or even more TVs as well. So I would like to say that um, the big goals start with small steps and that's where we are devoted to and obviously uh, you know, other speakers will talk about their contribution pretty much I believe to the same goal. Uh, so I've known Vic a long time too, and and uh, Vic and I have uh, grown up in the EDA business. And Vic's with um, Ansys. Ansys is a, uh, a a company that worries about multi physics problems and how to solve them. So a lot of DoD customers, and increasingly a lot of customers that are worried and concerned about energy. So it's great to have Vic here to, to hear what he has to say about this. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Vano. So uh, here I dubbed this uh, discussion as engineering the chill. How do we cool down everything which we are consuming in terms of energy? So both Jim and Wayne talk about uh, various uh, trends and what are the challenges and so on. So here we believe that our 
contribution to this world will be what we call pervasive simulation. Now, let me get into that a little bit more to help manage this uh, power and energy consumption around the world in all products, not just the chip, but also chip package system, the end product, and so on. So here, uh, let me start with the, just the basic building block of everything we do in terms of uh, all the verticals, mobile applications to automotive to IoT, uh, edge node, uh, which is becoming more and more important as uh, more complexity is put into the edge node analytics of IoT so that things are not always communicated to cloud and, and uh, essentially taking on the bandwidth of uh, uh, decision making. So to that end, this is the, the chart here shows, uh, uh, this is the CTO of TSMC who presented recently the problem which is the insatiable demand we have in terms of our end products and usage uh, on all applications, all vertical IoT verticals to uh, healthcare and, and so on, and autonomous uh, vehicles. It starts at the chip and then uh, starts at the IP as the basic building block, the basic intellectual property block which goes into bringing SOCs, the system on chip. And now with the Moore's law, uh, which is again ever, ever, this non-ending essentially, Recently, we heard a lot of R&D work going on at three nanometers, uh, minimum feature size. But to reach that, there are, people are going also in more than more, or what is called MTM. So looking at chip as going vertically in terms of complexity, which we all want. We want that AR, VR, we want those drone applications. So how do we achieve that? Then we want these data centers to constantly uh, compute data. Then we want our healthcare, instant health data analytics, so that demand is uh, essentially, in the last 35 years I've been in the industry, is really pumping up now. It's taking the semiconductor industry to a next level in terms of expansion, and people are already talking about major investments in this area. So 3D ICs, uh, large memories, the, our, our constant demand of taking millions of pictures around the world and 3D videos, which means more flash memories and so on. So that means vertical stack which means more analysis and more complexity in what we are trying to jam in, which means more power and energy consumption. So this becomes quite an interesting uh, problem. Now what happens is, to convert the power into the energy, essentially power over time, the concept of thermal comes in the picture. The heat, which we all feel in our mobile devices, to data centers, to all, all, all like Wine said, in our laptops, that's because the concept of self-heat. So this particular chart shows, uh, there are millions of, this is the uh, scatter chart, and then it con got converted into a nice bar chart, which shows the red lines, which are essentially what is commonly known as electromigration self-heat effect. So as you are jamming all this functionality on a chip, there are many things which are happening. The transistors are getting hotter, and they generate more heat locally, which essentially creates a runaway thermal situation. So you, one has to be able to manage that. Because what you predicted in terms of your product design is not essentially what you get because of this self-heat uh, phenomenon. So to achieve that, and also there's other macro trend which I wanted to share with you, some of you folks who are involved in the semiconductor and EDA research here at SJSU, these three charts represent what's happening in the concept of variability. So as you're driving these feature sizes on a transistor or on a chip, smaller and smaller, essentially the variation due to process variation, temperature variation, uh, so-called corner variation of various uh, process voltage temperature corners, things get out of control. And your chips now are getting over-designed, which is one of the root causes of energy consumption. So things are getting over-designed, over-margined, uh, essentially ending up into more and more power and energy consumption. So without going into the details in the interest of time, but these I wanted to show you the charts which are now pretty much recognized around the world in the semiconductor industry uh, because of the threshold variation as well as the supply voltage variation and scaling down which creates these headaches uh, for designers. So this is where the big data comes in, uh, talking about the problem space first and then solution space. Historically, all the chip design techniques and the chip design databases have resided in silos. So this is kind of a uh, metaphorical picture of power, timing, uh, your place and route information, some of the uh, package information. Is, this, all that information resides in different databases, which creates inefficiency, and that's what creates in a, uh, over margining of the design. 
So these silos essentially result into uh, over management or over margining and not energy efficient. So that's where most of the problems which you see today, how things are getting hotter and consuming more energy in data centers or they're not efficiently managed until big data, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning comes in the picture. Especially if you got a Galaxy 7. Yeah. <laughs> so I won't mention any product names, but last week, uh, in fact, Google uh, Sundar Pichai announced a $2.4 billion investment into massive data centers in 14 different states to be spent over five years. And what Google has done, of course, a great job, uh, Facebook has done a great job, or all the big companies in terms of energy consumption. However, with the new AI and neural networks, what Google has done now, which they just announced recently about a month ago, they have managed the massive data centers in terms of this energy efficiency by, by training the data set for temperature, for other physics, as we call it, in terms of what's happening to the pump in your data centers, what's happening to the air conditioning. So all that has to be simulated properly. And that's where uh, we as ANSYS come in the picture in terms of how do we help the complete design of this, uh, not just the chip package system, with machine learning and big data, but also how does that help in terms of uh, really designing your drones, your cars, your, uh, uh, your battery management, for example, which uh, Jim mentioned earlier. So the big data elastic compute platform, which we dubbed it as Seascape, as big data and machine learning, that's important. So this is one quick uh, proof point I want to show you. This was announced at the, the last year's design automation conference. This particular one is from NVIDIA, which is their latest GPU, which has 21 plus billion transistors, one trillion model elements, and that's the newest ADAS platform. This particular chip is used by Jensen Wong, was showing that recently at the Consumer Electronics Show, but this has 100, plus, 100 billion plus geometries on that particular chip, and this is called the Volta chip. So they used uh, some of the work which we did and using our big data uh, Seascape architecture, and they were able to, uh, they, that's why they announced it. But this is the highest capacity for power sign-off to do battery man to power management, power integrity management on the chip. And of course, it still consumes a lot of power of, because it's a huge GPU. It's the largest one in the world, which was just launched in January this year at the CES show. But this is an important part of that journey which we have to help the industry with uh, along all verticals to reduce power and then hence energy. So these are the other couple of proof points. Again, in the interest of time, I'll uh, skip those, but they will be available through uh, SJSU on the, on the panel discussions. But Qualcomm and AMD, to reduce power and reduce energy consumption, it's not a magic button, so it's not a magic tool. So the right side shows AMD, what they did over seven months on their latest CPUs, they have a best practices methodology they followed through. And by doing power regressions and energy regression, looking at the various workloads on a chip, they were able to reduce the overall power by almost 70% in terms of dynamic power. So this, is, this was not possible just with some uh, reasonable techniques, uh, circuit design techniques. Now, taking that to the power, to the bigger picture, where ANSYS comes in, they are the ones who acquired our company, which was based on chip power system. But the virtuous cycle of pervasive simulation comes in the picture to do the complete design of a product. So right from ideation phase, which you see on the left, and then it's a, it's a cycle of you know, looking at through the design phase, then through the product life cycle management, and again go into making changes in your end product, be it be Airbus or or the, uh, the engine uh, flow, uh, looking at the computational fluid dynamics or battery management using the same CFD techniques or chip power system design. So doing that, uh, the pervasive simulation now is used everywhere to reduce, uh, and there are many uh, components of that which result into managing not just the energy in one small domain, but also looking at uh, some of the thermal strategies, the more the, how do you do uh, access data? How do you uh, make it more efficient in terms of data analytics and so on? <coughs> so this is the whole cycle which we get involved with, with and we have about 40,000 customers with Ansys which go across all uh, verticals in terms of uh, end applications. And then uh, we worked, uh, this is another area where collaboration is required to really look at the problems which Jim and, and Wayne outlined earlier. We cannot do it alone, so we need 
collaboration. In this case, we collaborated with the GE for doing complete digital twin, which you will hear more about as time goes by. It's creating the model of the end product and then simulate through various conditions to uh, whatever those conditions be. If you are in uh, flying Airbus or, or your Boeing jet or to your mobile phone to your uh, AR, VR or drones. And you can create digital twin and watch it through its life cycle and then adjust accordingly to optimize its performance and energy consumption. So this is an important concept which is only possible through simulation and good modeling. Uh, various modeling techniques to make it as accurate as possible. So in this case, uh, GE actually looked at the turbine and then the massive amount of data was monitored in terms of adjusting the fins, for example, on a turbine or on, a, on the Airbus or Boeing jets and to make sure that the energy consumed by, you know, that's why you can see now very lightweight Dreamliner that is possible only because of the simulation and they use quite a bit of our products as well as other companies which provide similar products. So with that, I'll end it, and with just with the, the thing which people mentioned earlier, is uh, really renewable energy is in, in much demand in terms of new techniques. So this particular one also is one of our customers in Paris. The, I think in the expanded view, you'll see the, in the middle of the picture there, this is the uh, garden in Paris, and in the middle is a actual aluminum tree. It's, it's, it looks like a tree, but it's actually a wind power design. So it is consistent with the environment, and it, it's completely simulated using all kinds of, uh, some, uh, in terms of product simulations, RF antenna simulations, then also wind simulation and so on, to look at how much energy is created. For that, you need, again, uh, multi-physics and then multi-domain simulation to achieve these kinds of end designs. So this is a very nice uh, example right in the, in the city of Paris. So with that, I'll give it yeah. to the next person. Thanks, Rick. You know, I think in the first presentation we talked about energy. It's, it's not about producing more energy. It's about saving energy. Don't use it. You don't have to. If you can prevent it from using it, then, then we got a chance. Trying to always go drop a new well offshore is not the way to go. So with that, the guy from Texas, the oil guy, is up next. Drew is going to talk now. Okay. Thanks, Jim. So... The, the title of this panel had this phrase IoT in there, and we haven't done very much to talk about IoT, so I thought maybe it would be worth to uh, talk a little bit about um, IoT. And remember, we're in the IR4, present, you know, IR4 seminar series, which has a lot to do with you know, cyber physical systems and um, you know, cognitive computing in general. So I'm going to start off with a slide that says you need to have cognitive computing in order to actually make a lot of the interesting IoT applications work. Well, why is that? Well, um, first of all, a definition. So from my perspective, the IoT applications, especially at the edge, are electronic systems that fuse the technologies of sensing, processing, and communications, typically wireless. But they tend to be very focused on individual applications. They tend not to be general purpose, and that's key, because we can take advantage of the special purpose nature to do things like save energy. So, uh, Chris Rowan, in our last talk, showed this uh, uh, Amazon ad for a uh, uh, security camera that was down to $12 or something that you know, shot at incredibly high resolutions and incredibly capable things. Uh, another important uh, application that you know, some people have, I happen to have one of these things on the right, which is a Ring video doorbell. And um, it's another security camera-like application in some sense. It shoots video, but it shoots video in a different set of conditions. It's focused on telling me who's at my front door, right? Um, but the sensing part of it is challenged, as in the um, security camera. Um, it has a motion detector on it, but that motion detector can't easily discriminate between a person walking to my front door and what happened today when I got three notifications about the gr three different um, uh, sanitation trucks driving through because you know we have the, the regular trash, and we have our recycling, and we have our um, compostable stuff, right? It can't really distinguish between those. Well, what would it take to do that? Well, we're going to need to put some intelligence somewhere into the system. We could do that in the cloud, and that might be a good place to do it, but then I got to spend the energy to send all this video before I you trigger. Um, and, and what neither of these nice pictures show you is how is this thing actually powered? Both of these devices require a plug because today 
to do this kind of processing is too much to run in a battery powered application. But one of the things we hear about all the time is when we're in the IoT, um, we've got to be worried about 10 year battery lives and things. So, you know, how are we going to make this work? So, um, from an academic perspective, a lot of the work that goes on at the hardware level and the system level in IoT is about balancing the computational part of this and the communications part of it. Today's applications tend to send the video stream to some very powerful computer to do the work. But that means we're spending a lot of energy on communications. Um, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, yeah, we're, um, fir we're firing up the radio, which consumes that's right. a lot of and, power. And the communications right. radio is, is enormous, and the amount of bandwidth associated with the application like video is also enormous. It's like when you shut enormous. Bluetooth off on your phone. You know, you extend the battery life by but, 2x. But we don't do a lot of video by Bluetooth, right? Because it's not very well suited for that bandwidth level. So um, an alternative architectures put more computational power into the IoT Edge device in order to reduce the amount of communications bandwidth. And so, um, you know, the folks in, in the research labs for many years have been trying to come up with the balance of energy use between computation and communication. Um, and my view is that this term that, that's become popular, ambient intelligence, is essentially essential in order to enable some of these IoT applications at the edge. Um, and in those situ systems, we process most of our data locally so we only have to turn on the radio occasionally once um, we do it. Now, we may still send you know, video streams up to the cloud. I still want to be able to get access to who's at my front door. I just don't want to be sending that up to the cloud all the time. I want it to make a, the device to have made a good decision locally before it starts to, to send data. And, and we can reduce the communication energy. This is a fantastic application for the neural network enabled you know, uh, cognitive computing applications. And there's an enormous number of people who are working in this area at this point. So this is a slide that I showed back in, in my panel presentation back in December, I guess it was. Uh, and so when we look at neural networks, we have a lot of math going on and very high connectivity. Um, so this is the, you know, the diagram I showed before. But I, I want to focus in on two things. When we think about these neural networks, um, we think about massive levels of connectivity. Um, and each one of those connections have associated with them a unique weight, which helps determine how much this input affects that output. And then the, the fundamental math operation of multiply accumulate, which is key to you know, implementing these things. And those are challenges when I want to implement this thing with a battery that lives for 10 years. Now, the opportunities for optimization come with what are the, the knobs I have to turn in all that math. I can play with the precision of the arithmetic. I can take advantage of the fact that many of the possible connections have a weight value that is zero or so close to zero that I'll still be able to recognize what I'm looking for if I treat it as zero. And then the, the last thing is there's an enormous amount of work that's gone on in should I do this work in the digital domain or should I consider doing some of the work in the analog domain? Another slide that we showed last time is how do we manage these weights? If you think about all these connections, the storage, where we keep these weights, is a big deal in terms of how much energy we use in the application. And by the way, the cost of the resulting system. Um, if I could keep the weights on chip, I would love to, but I have a limited amount of capacity. If I have to put external memory, like flash or maybe DRAM, um, that's going to cost me some throughput. It may also cost me a lot more energy to get it done. Uh, and then there are techniques that we've been using in computer systems for many years, like loop unrolling, which these different network topologies can use. But when I unroll a loop, what I'm saying is I want to do I use the same set of weights over and over and over again, which means it's going to be longer until I get my first answer. I may get you know, more answers by doing it this way, may get them at lower energy, but can I tolerate the added latency of doing that enrolling? And then of course we have all the problems with communication, um, especially because there is new academic work happening every day and exciting new results that say, no, actually I can tweak this network and I can come up with a new topology, a new diagram, a new set of approaches. And so if I over-specialize the hardware, I may not be able to keep up to date with what's going on. 
what are my goals? Um, well, I want to be able to operate for years, maybe 10 years off a battery that looks like that one there, which you know a lot of us first got introduced whenever the, we opened up our first PC because the real-time clock and calendar inside those tends to use one of those batteries. Um, if we take a look at a CR2-2032 battery, it has about you know, uh, 0.65 watt hours of lifetime capacity. So if you want something to last for 10 years, you divide that, figure out how many hours that is, that means you don't get to use very many very many, many microwatts per you know, minute. Um, so what are the techniques that we can use to save this energy? Well, as I said, we can do our inferencing locally um, as long as we can make sure the computational energy is lower than the communication energy. We can try to do less work per sample. So maybe I've got this gorgeous, you know, very high resolution image, but for the purpose of deciding whether I should do more work, maybe I should take a smaller picture and try to focus in on a little bit so I don't have to do quite as much work. If I see something interesting, maybe now I'll go look at the full data set and try to do something deeper. Um, I can look less frequently. I probably don't have to look 60 times per second to figure out if the Amazon guy is dropping a package off. And of course, avoid the energy that we waste all the time. Uh, that's especially important when circuits are idle. So I'm going to focus in on that part. So in CMOS chips, um, we always want to try to keep information that's frequently used close at hand. So we want to rather you use on-chip memory instead of off-chip. Something I teach my kids, you want to turn off the lights when you leave the room. So as soon as I recognize that I'm done with something, it'd be really good to try to shut myself off if possible. If I can afford to slow down, that's a lot better than rushing to the stop sign and then hitting the brakes really hard. And, and the one that, that always surprises me, you know, if there's no one listening, it's not worth talking, right? And, and that happens a lot. If the, if the device you're talking to is actually currently shut you down. You haven't been to Santa in. Cruz, huh? Yeah, exactly. There are a lot of guys <laughs> talking to themselves, man. So, you know, in, 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 our, in our chips, we waste a lot of energy wiggling capacitances when yeah. there's no one listening. So uh, a couple years ago, uh, my company introduced a, a product we call the Energy Processor that tries to take advantage of some of these things and build hardware-based systems that automatically manage power control. It takes advantage of a couple phenomena. One is that most of the periods of idle time on these chips are pretty short, and that means the time it takes you to react to them, to take advantage, to shut down, um, you can take a lot more advantage if you can make your control go faster. Second, by partitioning our designs into smaller components, we're much more able to find larger amounts of idle time but we have to have a more capable control system to do that. Um, one of the real killers is a lot of the idle times we find end with a deadline. By the time we know it's time to wake up, we may have some deadline that we have to hit uh, so that we don't drop a packet on a communication interface or our video doesn't flicker or something like that. And if the overhead of your control system takes more time than you have, well then you can't afford to go to that lower power state. And this is the one that really kills me, because I have been to the DMV before. Um, you know, people all tend to want to wake up at the same time. Um, and if you're stuck in line behind somebody and you've got an appointment, it's much more likely you're going to miss your deadline if there's more people in front of you. And so the reason that we put hardware circuits onto the chips to try to do this is to take advantage, to go as fast as we can and to go as parallel as we can in order to be able to take advantage of the largest amount of idle time. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Now for something completely different. Now for something completely different. Yeah, so you, you can see how it started. You know, macro, a little less macro. OK, simulation, deep. Now, now we're going to go to the cloud. Love to hear what you have to say. All right. Thank you, Jim. So very quickly, uh, my company, Akasha, uh, does uh, cloud planning for enterprises. Uh, we're based out of Santa Clara, um, and just some setting of stage for you guys. Um, essentially, there are two main drivers behind cloud migrations. So one is convenience. You know, when you look at all these data centers enterprises have owned for decades, you know, they have to manage the entire data center, they have to manage all the hardware, they have to manage all the applications, patching them, upgrading them, 
taking care of the life cycle and end of lifing them and all of that. So once you move to the cloud, the cloud vendors such as Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they're taking care of all of that. So convenience was one of the major drivers. The second major driver is costs. And as we all know, most decisions are made on the economics of running your environment. So costs, when we break down the cost of running in a data center, is the data center management, the power and cooling of the environment, um, and all of those. So with our products, um, you know, by the way, these are our customers and partners. Over 100,000 applications have been modeled using our software. So the data that I, I'm talking about today is something that we've mined over the use of our software across these multiple environments. Um, when you really look at, uh, did we, oh, here's the slide that I wanted to use. When you really look at a data center and what is being consumed in there, you have um, applications and these apps run on virtual machines that run on physical servers. Those physical servers are connected to networks, um, routers, et cetera, and then you have storage supporting them. Each of those components uses energy. And you know, Wayne's slide showed the breakup of energy usage across several devices. Uh, for servers, the average uh, power usage is 850 kilowatt hours. So that is pretty significant. Now, when you have, when every enterprise has a data center, it's like everybody here owning their own restaurant, um, their own factory to you know, build their clothes, et cetera, it becomes quite energy inefficient. You know? So this is, uh, the title there is um, um, a report that was done in 2016, but it was uh, based out of data that was collected in 2014, that 2% of the entire US energy consumption is in data centers. So that's 70 billion kilowatt hours, okay? And um, with our software, when we look at all the uh, apps that we've modeled and we break down the cost savings, et cetera, uh, by consolidating multiple data centers into public clouds, you can improve efficiencies by 30 to 60%. This is data we've collected over those 100,000 plus machines that we've modeled. Now, why is this the case? So very interesting, and this is a slide that uh, Jim was kind enough to send to me. <laughs> um, when you look at cloud computing, data centers, typical new data centers, which are also being modernized, and existing data centers, there's a huge difference in uh, the um, energy consumption. Um, An interesting story there, Amazon and Netflix partnered some seven, eight years ago. That was the time when Netflix was just booming, you know, they were collecting a lot of data on usage. Between 8 p.m. and midnight, Netflix usage was beyond uh, belief, right? Amazon was supporting Netflix, so they cut their teeth into building a new architecture to support environments such as Netflix that have a massive surge at a certain period of time and are completely dead for the rest of time. So they built automated software that would monitor, that could scale out instances of an application if needed, and then scale back down to zero and physically shut off machines and shut down big parts of the data center and therefore save on energy consumption. Now when Amazon built that new architecture based on their partnership with Netflix, they then turned around and made that available to all enterprises. Hence the 30 to 60% savings from energy if you use a public cloud. Similarly, we had uh, Miles Ward from Google, who's their uh, solution architect for the Google Cloud Platform. He presented at one of the webinars that I hosted, and he just gave a breathtaking view into what Google's doing with their cloud data centers. They have amazing modern, new cooling and energy management uh, infrastructure in place. They've laid these fat pipes underneath the oceans that connect all of the different data centers together. And they've made available their analytics software to all enterprises. So you could uh, just spawn an IoT application in Google, run it for a few minutes, pay just cents, and you're off. You don't have to go build a Hadoop environment just to do your analytics. So this is just 
the the magnitude of difference that um, cloud architecture has brought to the notion of um, energy consumption. And I do uh, want to just point out really quickly, so this is the output of our software. The big red line on top is, uh, this is a real world analysis uh, that our software did. Um, we obviously have the customer's uh, permission to use this slide. Um, the, the top red bar there is their, the on-prem cost. And as we know, cost is directly correlating to energy consumption. So the top bar there is cost. And below that, you see those little lines. That's Amazon, uh, Azure from Microsoft, IBM Cloud, Google Cloud, and Oracle Cloud. So this is a real world modeling exercise that we did. So for that application, you can see uh, the on-prem cost was almost twice what was the cloud cost. So just um, a quick uh, view into you know, what cloud environments, public clouds, have brought to uh, energy consumption in terms of saving costs. And I saved you time, Jim. Thank I you. was inside the you time were. limit allocated to me. <laughs> you, well, thanks for uh, sitting through our presentation part of this. Now the fun begins. You know, and uh, I want to encourage folks to think about a question. We'll ask for questions from the audience here in a second or two. Uh, Sean's going to be our master of ceremonies on that. That way I get to talk, too. That's right. And, but, you know, I get to ask a question first, right? So one of the questions I think we always get wrapped up in, let's do some definitional stuff first, right? Energy, power, heat, right? So Vic touched on it uh, first, but Voyan, why don't you start and Vic, you chime in. <coughs> As a typical electronic guy, when I start facing the PG&E's and Southern California Edison's of California, we spoke different languages. And for them, everything was about energy. And for us, everything was about power. But there's a simple equation which connects these two. So I think um, the language was one of the barriers. But when we started putting real numbers in terms of how many set of boxes we have and how much power and what, how does this convert into energy and how this convert into power plants, then we started this connection. I, I think that, uh, you know, the battery size, and I didn't speak too much about my company's uh, products, but on the battery size, this is really where energy again appears. So you have energy at the power plant and then you have in your in your PC, you have power and then suddenly energy appears again because you have a limited source of of energy into the battery. So I think we are converging in this micro and macro world are coming together on the energy side. But, um, you know, when somebody mentions to energy, you will probably know that guys either come from mobile or from power plants. And if somebody mentions power, they come from the PC or some set of box world. Hey, Jim. Yeah. So uh, we, we kind of briefly touched on, you know, backstage earlier tonight. So I, I want you to answer this question in, in the smallest amount of, of uh, profanity and swear words. <laughs> so surplus uh, in oil, we have a total huge surplus, right? So why is the EPA opening up the Pacific West Coast for drilling? Hey, can I add, add on, jump on? All right. Yeah, I mean, the, the price of barrel oil is now 60 bucks a barrel. We're in oversupply. The United States is a net exporter. We're selling off the strategic energy reserve. As of uh, last week, Trump probably needed some new furniture in the White House or something. But so, you know, so why the hell are we uh, drilling offshore? I don't know. I mean, any, 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 anybody care to comment? It's money. I, yeah, it's money. That's it. If somebody can make sixty bucks a barrel, I guess that's probably why they're doing it. And but where they're going to sell it, probably in China is probably where it's going, especially here on the West Coast. So you guys, you know, I, I don't get to sit in front of an audience like this or get taped very often about this sort of stuff. But, you know, uh, why are we going to open all the West Coast up to drilling oil offshore? I live in Santa Cruz. They're going to have oil wells out in the middle of Monterey Bay. We don't need to do it. Somebody's just making 15 bucks a barrel off that oil. We don't need it. What we need is more renewable resources. So. I think uh, we're generally in agreement now. How, how you turn that into political action is something different. So for the educators out here, maybe the people that will listen, please help us establish the cognitive science 
discipline and help us educate students to help us solve these problems because I'm going to be gone before this happens. Sorry. Not for a long time. Oh, thanks. But uh, I do uh, want to say if you do have a question, we do have a, a microphone up here and we'd love to hear um, what you have to say and, and uh, what you have to think. Um, but I do I want to go to Grima. Okay. Said, yeah. It was yeah. Uh, interesting you were talking about cloud computing and I um, it it drives transformation and lowers costs, mm -hmm. most definitely. But um, hybrid cloud mm -hmm. computing, when you have um, a private cloud and third party public cloud, is it efficient and is it secure? Mm -hmm. Very good questions. And those are uh, the questions that drive customer decisions. Um, hybrid cloud is here to stay for a while because people are not willing to give up their data centers. There's a lot banking on the data centers. There are livelihoods there. You know, when you give up your data center and move everything to the cloud, your admins lose their jobs. And so they don't want to give that up for a while. Or there are applications that are custom built and they are just not able to be re-architected for the cloud, so they're going to stay on-prem. Databases are staying on-prem, you know, as far as we can see. Um, so there are many reasons for a hybrid environment to be developed in the, in the short term, at least. Uh, are they secure? Um, that is the million dollar question. There are many startups, as you know, the investors here in the industry would know. Lots of startups spawned on uh, making the cloud secure, making the hybrid cloud secure. Um, the answer to that question is it is evolving, as all technology is evolving. At this point, from where we stand with all the modeling we're doing, we are seeing a lot of trust in the cloud now. Um, there, because of software such as ours, the cloud is not being seen as a mysterious black box. It is being seen as um, something that's secure, something that uh, the cost is well understood. And so there is a good movement of applications that are ready to be moved, ready to be re-architected to the cloud, but a number of uh, applications still continue to reside on-prem, so the hybrid architecture is here to stay for a while. Yeah, and I think in our industry, that when we're involved with the semiconductor and electronic system stuff, a lot of people feel they're proprietary data. They want to hold close to them. And yeah, and I think uh, in the last 10 years, that trust has increased. And I always find it kind of amusing, because if you look, I, I bank at Chase, you know, big old bank here in the West Coast and all across the United States. And so most people don't knew, know this, but all their data is backed up on uh, servers in the Ukraine. So think about that. You know, all your all your financial data and you know, which you would want to secure is yeah, it's on a cloud in, you know, Vallejo, but it's also backed up in Ukraine, which might have some volatility, right? So so the trust thing, uh, I think I'd much rather have Google, for example, or AWS be the guys that re I rely on security mm -hmm. than the guy that, you know, stays up all night hacking my system, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think, I think we're all moving there, right? But it's taken a while. And certainly the generation that can't comes after us, they're already there, right? Yeah. So this will be transformational, I think, in the next 10 years for sure. I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, electric uh, vehicles. You mentioned uh, in 2020 there's going to be an explosion in, uh, in, in that respect. And this is for Vic as well. Um, it's really taking off. What uh, is the role of simulation, or how, how does that play in energy transfer, um, as, as we talked about a little bit before? So uh, that's a very important question, because uh, just to give you an idea of our own experience, when I say own meaning ANSYS experience, it's, uh, we have about 60 or so autonomous vehicle, automotive vehicle type customers. So the way people are using simulation is really for this whole chip package system design. For example, start at the battery. How do you we use the, many of our customers use our CFD, or computational fluid dynamic software, to look at the chemical reactions, looking at the life of a battery, how much energy is consumed by the system around it. So you have to do the simulation not only for the battery. So a multi-physics simulation involves CFD, 
plus the transmission line itself, let's say in an EV, just a single transmit, uh, transmission line is there or a, uh, and which fits it to, with, a, with a battery or with a rather motor. So induction motor plus you have to simulate that, plus you have to have your battery and then put on the workload conditions. So in terms of driving conditions, temperature, how will the car perform in on the Arctic Circle in Finland and above, or Antarctica, for example, or in Sahara Desert. So we, uh, typically our customers will pace their simulation. That's where the what-if analytics comes in the picture. And uh, with some of our work also is happening within the machine learning and AI, because the number of scenarios is so huge. For example, just to give you a real case where I was at one of the customer meetings in France, what they are designing is a, f a 4K video camera right in front of the sensor uh, camera uh, for right behind the windshield. And it looks at everything which is passing across the car, right from is it a, a small animal crossing the car or is it a, a big rock in the middle of the road or is it a child or is it an adult or a sun shining right into the camera maybe. and so on. Sorry? Uh, your grandma on a crosswalk. Uh, anybody, yeah. And so the grandma? camera captures it all and it analyzes it quickly and it passes on the information to CPU for doing analytics, which then draws power from the battery in the car. So one has to be able to simulate all these scenarios and that's where the energy comes in the picture. Earlier, uh, Jim, you had asked about power versus energy. So really power over time. And you have to, the longer the simulation time, of course, it becomes heavily computational intensive. Just a few milliseconds of window to analyze, let's say, emulation. A typical emulation now is required to analyze the various conditions of a car or a mobile, advanced mobile, or some of the things why these phones are getting hot because they have not been able to simulate all the conditions of a, a gaming app, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, and that's what some of the things which uh, you know both Drew and, and Wayne mentioned. But it's, it's very almost impossible to capture all these scenarios. So and th it starts with this multi-physics, multi-domain simulation across the energy source to the use case. And there are thousands and thousands of use cases our customers go through. Yeah, I'm not buying an autonomous car anytime soon, you know. <laughs> it's kind of scary. You know, you, scary. I, I actually, uh, let me set the question up and then everybody, I'll start with Drew. And then uh, everybody can pile on. All right, so most cyber breaches occur at the edge, right? They're an edge device. Okay, now we got edge devices that are, on, are embedded in systems that you can't even get to that'll last maybe 10 years or longer, right? And way outside of warranty, by the way. But uh, with that said, you know, how do, you, how do they decommission themselves? Or how do we decommission them? Because at some point, the data they're taking is no longer accurate or required, and we don't do anything with it. But it's sitting out there chugging along doing things, right? So why don't I start with Drew about that one? Yeah, so I think in the design of that system, you need to consider that use case, which is the end of life. And um, almost all these IoT devices occasionally have to phone home. Whether they've found something interesting or not found something interesting, you, you occasionally want to check in with the mothership, with the cloud. And I think you need to design these systems such fashion so that the cloud can tell them, okay, you're done. And uh, you know maybe it's not Mission Impossible where it self-destructs, but at least decommissions itself, you know, electronically, so that it doesn't become a, a, a vulnerable place. Yeah, I I think that's the perfect use case for uh, an application that would reside in the cloud. So companies like Echelon, you know, they are putting units in every uh, piece of lighting out there. In, on the streets, inside houses. Yeah, smart lights, yeah. Smart lights, and of course we have billions of phones, um, your doorbells and cameras. Each of those is like an intelligent mini computer with an IPv6 uh, IP address. And so how do you manage all of them? How do you manage the fact that they shouldn't be breached? How do you manage their life uh, cycle? And I do believe that this is like managing a data center, but at a huge scale. So there are apps that already exist in Google, in Amazon, that uh, you can code immediately. And they will manage the life uh, cycle of those um, items for you, those, those instruments. 
um, manage the fact that you know they need to be updated or that they they need to be end of life. If there are breaches, they need to be secured away from everything else. So um, yeah, I mean this is a very interesting time, uh, you know, with all the access that's available to everybody with the uh, just the scale of uh, geographic yeah, <laughs> presence. I don't, I don't think those Russians ever sleep. You know, so we got we got to worry about their bots, right? Yeah, they look very happy because they have yeah. lots of things to do. They have yes, more things exactly. to hack. You know? Sorry, Vic. No, I just want to say one of the hottest topics recently I came across and with our customers as well as uh, the recent conferences is the side channel attack. So w what's happening now is as we put more and more intelligence into the edge nodes, these are getting quite complex chips actually, not just the simple sensors. And the, and the definition of side channel attack, unless you're completely aware of it, is when IoT node is trying to uh, collect the data and transmit the data, during that time, it emits what are known as side channels. That's a definition of side channel. So it's a very, very, very faint signal, and that's the time a hacker can come in. So some of the decommissionable uh, chips we talked about, uh, or drones, you know, go, going into wrong hands can attack us. Attacking drone with a lot of, you know, nightmare scenarios, which Netflix, I think, one of the documentaries they showed. So all those things are happening because of the side channel attack. So it's a huge. Uh, question now. So what is happening is during that side channel attack, the hacker can go in and then can uh, d decrypt the key which is already embedded in the system. So one very interesting surprise or insight I got was we talked about energy and power consumption and so on on chips to package to system. But this particular customer who was involved in a uh, lot of IoT around the car and like the BMW, Mercedes Benz and so on, uh, the new i8 BMW has 108 processors, ARM processors around the periphery of the car, and it's about 100 sensors now. So side, side channel attack can, can go anytime because the, the chips are always emanating something. So what he said was he would, when we showed him the power profile or the hotspot of a chip, he said, I don't want hotspot. I want, I want to increase the power consumption so that there is there's a uniform, either uniform color on the, on the thermal. Very interesting way to solve this side channel attack problem. So the hacker is not able to decipher the, the encryption at all because there is no co cooler or hotter spot on the chip. Yeah. It's uniformly hot or uniformly you know, orange. You're, you're trying to hide the signal inside exactly, noise. Exactly, so this is very interesting uh, creative ideas people are coming out with to, because they'll be you know, in the one trillion sensor world which everybody paints, let's assume realistically by 2025 there are even 200 million sensors. We all have to face that issue as a, as a service and technology provider. Uh, thanks Vic. Voyant, instead of answering that question, okay, I'd like you to talk about the uh, the residential gateway problem in Japan. Let's go back to the Fukushima power plant blowing up. So I'm tempted to oh, first go ahead, uh, go ahead. comment on this one because uh, you know Vic mentioned a very interesting issue. So um, this uniform thermal distribution is very important because it doesn't give anyone any information to you what is going in your chip. But it's even more important that you have a software which will detect that somebody has attempted through uh, different methods to shave off a layer from the chip surface and to cause this chip to unveil more information than it's needed. So I'm, 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 I'm sure we'll discuss that after this panel. Uh, but uh, yes, I mean, we started with a company in Newport Beach, uh, Mindspeed, who was the key supplier of uh, uh, chips to NTT West and uh, uh, has supplied tel telephone guys in uh, Japan. Telephone, big telephone guys yeah. in Japan and uh, uh, obviously the whole issue which was kind of how do we comply with uh, the standard for broadband communication declared in Europe and you know how we uh, they don't have regulations or I would say volunteer agreements like we have but then the Fukushima disaster happened and then suddenly something which was kind of a, just a voluntary discussion about power became uh, a very important discussion because all these set boxes have been consuming energy, massive amounts of energy, and now that came into the equation. So uh, you felt that change mood when you come to Japan during these times and there was no cooling. There's uh, elevators turned off, there was no cooling, it was a clear consequence. So, 
So I think it's better for us to think earlier about energy and power than if we, God forbid, hit hit us something like this, then we have to go to back to, um, you know, to, to try to save energy. Just one comment maybe is, I think all these issues we discuss here on power uh, remind me on the discussion about different instruction sets we had like 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, I believe we need consolidation in that space that we agree on certain power management paradigms, how we will manage power data centers in rings, phones, in the cars, and so on, and we unify that. And that's exactly how we started Agios. We started uh, with the wish to have an independent provider of power management tools and technology and methodology uh, based on a, on a unified standard. And uh, now for five years we are doing a lot of work on IEEE standards to unify how all these devices will be reporting what they consume and communicate between them. So one server can tell the other server or the ring device can tell another ring device which may have some redundancy how to deal with the mm -hmm. fact that the battery is low on some. So I, I, th I think there's an interesting discussion. We could go on and oh, on. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> well, you know, here's what I was hoping you would also say, right? So if you look at that problem in Japan, Japan has 85 million households. Every household is communicated through a digital uh, gateway. Think of like your the cable box. And it's digital. And it, does, it consumes about 300 watts, which is a, it's pretty darn hot, right? It's more than your PC for sure. So, so if you th multiply that by, uh, you know, 85 million households, that's a power plant, right? Remember, they were down on power plants. Uh, another couple facts about Japan. The northern part of Japan was implemented by General Electric, and so it's 60 hertz. The southern part of Japan, Osaka, was implemented by Siemens, so it's 50 hertz. So they don't have a common grid across the country. So when Fukushima went out, they lost about a third of the 60 hertz power available to Japan. So they started shutting off air conditioners and, and uh, escalators and elevators. You know, people probably got a lot healthier, but you know, um, but it wasn't near as convenient, right? So the project that uh, he worked on, and I had a, sl a slight hand in it, we took the 300 watts uh, with some software control and just putting it to sleep intelligently to 100 watts, right? So what that meant in Japan is they could avoid building another Fukushima. To give you an idea, a small change mm -hmm. can really have a huge impact. So anyway, I, I take credit for all the time, but it was actually buoyant. You know. <laughs> back back to California. Yeah. I, I, uh, we had a just a short discussion um, talking about the um, California Epic Award and how California ranks. Could you, could you ex, uh, explain a little bit more about that? So I, I was very lucky that I was invited to a similar event at uh, UCI campus in Irvine about energy. And there was a couple of very interesting people from California Energy Commission who were interested to know what are we doing with the devices to reduce their power consumption. So that was 2011, 2012. Uh, California invested in this CalPlug Institute, and I became part of that as advisor. So it's a, um, an example how uh, California is, I would say, ahead of the other states in the country, being very aggressive not only in the generation of energy and solars, but also in efficiency, not only buildings and roof tiles, but also devices, uh, you know, all devices we use. So part of that is what Sean mentioned, this EPIC program. So the governor with the executive order has, um, you know, formed uh, a success, one, I, th I think $160 million fund per year where California is investing in energy innovation. And uh, we qualified, we tried once, we failed, we tried second time, we won. But uh, this is something where I would encourage all the participants here to look at that. It's a very good website, a lot of information. It's managed out of the Research and Development Office in Sacramento. And um, there's now a smaller fund which actually uh, uh, supplies uh, just the initial ideas. So if you have just something on a piece of paper, 
um, yeah, you will be my competitor because we will be competing against for the, again for the same funds, but I definitely encourage you because uh, all together we can make even a more difference for the state and, yeah. and for the country. Well, and there's nothing better than grants because you don't have to pay them back. Right, so so yeah. To any startup, we should run companies like that. Yeah, well, I try to. Whenever yeah, I can. you're the VC, right? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, we got a question. EDA question. Um, so I've worked in EDA for decades, and I started off as a power electronics guy before doing that. And the support for doing power analysis and chip design is miserable. Yeah. It has been for decades. I've been trying to fix it and got nowhere. Um, is anybody trying to fix that? And how does that impact something like doing moves from RTL design into asynchronous design that would certainly use a lot more, uh, less, less power? power? Yeah, I mean, I mean, let's, you know, so there's lots, the ED, I can't speak for all EDA guys, that's for sure, but you know, uh, they've, they've made some money. Obviously, ANSYS uh, uh, is, uh, bought Apache a few years ago, and Apache is continuing to be invested in. Cadence has got some pretty good solutions. Uh, Synopsis is. Uh, I would uh, disagree. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> I have to use them on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, as versus nothing, and and then but uh, you know, and then Synopsis is partnering with a VIX company, right? So here's the question you may be asking: Is why isn't anybody investing in that? If if it's such an important problem. That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean. It, 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 it's tough sometimes to get the, because to really do this, it's going to end up costing you about, oh, I don't know, uh, close to $10 million over five years, right? So is it a big enough market and is it a big enough opportunity for somebody to uh, uh, invest, right? So that's the basic question. And, you know, honestly, EDA hasn't been an area where we've seen a lot of uh, uh, venture investment, institutional investors, right? So what's got to happen is kind of, you know, what Voyan did. You know, I mean, you get some guys together, you get clever in terms of getting grants and stuff, and you try to produce a solution. Uh, the other key thing is trying to get a customer that will work with you and help you develop that capability. So I don't have a real good answer other than that. It hasn't been an area people have wanted to invest no. in. It should be increasingly so. so. So there were certainly a set of companies that tried, uh, ten ish years ago, um, when the, with the rise of the mobile phone as a as an interesting platform, uh, they saw an opportunity to build some media companies that tried to work on analysis, power analysis at the at the I don't know about ideation, but at least at the design phase, um, and they didn't find customers. You know, there were uh, some interesting companies that they were able to do, but in general, the they it, it from my perspective, there was a chicken and egg problem. There weren't enough people. While Intel famously hit the power wall, um, this was a power wall, not an energy wall, where they uh, started saying, hey, we're going to back off on scaling frequency every processor generation as hard as we were because it's too much power to cool. Um, we all believed that that was going to mean that everyone was going to have to consider power to be a first class design issue. But it's been a long time, and still the vast majority of designs that we see, at least in the semiconductor space, considered power to be a, well, it's either can I fit into my package from a thermal perspective, or can I survive long enough on my battery, which is an energy problem. Um, we believe that part of that is a chicken and egg problem, that the design techniques weren't quite um, ready and available to all the design teams so that they would then need the tools to do the analysis because you know an analysis tool doesn't help you if you're not going to be able to do the design that that's associated with it so um, so we're hoping that, that that tide is changing but certainly there, there were a number of um, uh, companies like we can I mean, go back to powerscape and uh, cofluent and um, Oh gosh, the other guys. Dosia, Dosia. Yeah, Dosia and stuff. You know, they ended up, you know, either completely disappearing or getting absorbed into Intel, basically. Uh, you know, because there wasn't oh, a, yeah. a market That's for their right. tools. So, yeah. So I hear your question. You're looking for a solution. You may be talking to the wrong guys. <laughs> I've got a solution. There's just nobody's funding anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's 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 the issue. John Kane. Oh. May we help you, sir? 
Yeah, I'm uh, John from Aerolytics. We make uh, smart drones for indoor security uh, in uh, homes and businesses. And haircuts. And uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> You no, put no. The propellers our, on the bottom. Our, our drone is up high. You don't hear. Yeah. It. Anyway, um, not intrusive. So, so thanks so much for mentioning drones about five times and, and a lot about batteries. So we know about the analysis part. We actually use the Ansys software, right. uh, which is really good. But uh, my question is more to maybe what the audience is also interested in. Not not only our drones, but in our phones and all that stuff, which you guys already talked about. Is is uh, the for a drone, the flight time is killing us. You know? yeah. And even if we're slow and not taking so much power, all the things that you guys said and how much, we think the drone is the ultimate edge device, but so it's it's not like your Xfinity camera that needs that wire down to the, like you guys mentioned, it's, it's out there and it's a leash is only as far as his battery can go. So. The general question is, uh, where do you see, give us the trade secrets and technology roadmap and where you think battery technology is going. And I know you said get involved with innovation. Uh, you said something innovation and all, all that stuff. And I know Elon Musk is spending a billion dollars on it. But just in general for us consumers and then uh, the businesses that want batteries to be, you know, years instead of seconds. <laughs> uh, any, any secrets on where battery technology might be going? And well, you know, you, you look at Tesla. Let's we'll start there, right? Are they fundamentally changing the battery? Nope. It's the same old Panasonic battery they've been using forever. Where they're make, What they're doing is they're making it a hell of a lot cheaper because of scale. And they're also off, offering different form factors. So, you know, like when you built the Tesla, you only had one form factor, right? So now they're going to have, so that means different applications can use it, right? So the real way to do it is just consume, you know, my opinion is kind of what we've been saying. Don't use the power. That's what you got to do. No, I'm also going to say, uh, firstly, thank you for using ANSYS tool for some of the simulations. Sure, sure. But, uh, I'm saying good things about it. <laughs> but more importantly, what I've seen is there are two or three research areas which are happening for, uh, for drones, as an example. Is uh, energy harvesting is one. So just based on speci specifically light flying objects, which are going and, and crisscrossing a lot of EMI waves uh, to do energy harvesting. There are at least five universities I think I can think of who are deep research, and they're getting uh, funding also. I think Virginia Tech is also one of them. The other one is uh, antennas. I'm, I'm guessing, without knowing your antenna design, but antenna design is super critical. So it's not just the battery, of course. The battery has to be, everything has to improve. So, but antenna design people find in terms of how much power is getting consumed just for transmission, you know, when your drone is transmitting, waves which may not be highly optimized. For example, uh, Facebook, you probably saw their Aquila project, which they now made it public. It's a thousand feet long, uh, you know, wingspan, and it's only about 1,100 pounds, right, uh, for internet, uh, right? It's like flowing above us right now. So they use, they have 500 small antennas on, the, on each wing, and they have completely optimized it using some of these HFSA simulation. I'm not trying to advertise ANSYS product, but a, a good antenna simulation <laughs> from anybody for that matter. And then uh, uh, connecting the dots with your battery, you know, and your power consuming uh, chip design. So <coughs> it's all connected in terms of multi-physics. So I would recommend really going deep dive into that particular mm -hmm. part is antenna, see how much power it is consuming and uh, uh, energy harvesting. Well, I'm gonna. I'm going to thank you guys, right? You know, it, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the, uh, the time you spent tonight. Appreciate it. Informative stuff, you know. You, you can hear in this, like, security ought to be the next thing we talk about at some point. <coughs> and uh, I want to thank Sean. Sean's always the, the voice of IR4, the voice of IR4. But the best part of the evening is right now. Zinfandel from Rumbar. You are my Vanna. I'm your Vanna. You're my Vanna. And everyone has a, has a uh, uh, raffle ticket. Oh, there you go. So I already mixed them up. I'm going to pull one. And someone has the, uh, the honor of walking away with this. It is, the number is 
436561. Oh, we got a winner. Bingo. Are you, a, are you a Sensei State student? God love you. <laughs> are, are you of drinking age? Yes. <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for being here. Our next um, series, uh, speaker series, will be in April. Is that correct? Yep. Do we have a date? April 17th. April 17th. Mark that down. And uh, we'll get all that information out to you. Please, push this out. Push this out to, to your communities and your uh, social communities. Because we want to pack this place. And there's a reason for that. And, uh, and, and this man has a dream. He does. He really does. And uh, to, uh, to have something here at San Jose State, did you want to just? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, you know, we've been talking about it. I believe, and I think a lot of other people do too, is that we got to have this cogn cognitive science capability at, at San Jose State to make our students, you know, marketable in our community, right? And so, you know, it starts with a discussion. Uh, the university has to kind of figure out what, how to go about that. There's never funding for anything, right? No, certainly nothing new. So, but if we just start getting the word out there and getting people involved, I think it'll help us uh, to get this school or, or whatever they want to call it, you know, um, going. So anyway, I want to thank everybody's participation. Uh, you know, I mean, Sean's been here all along. Uh, Emily's done a great job of, you know, shepherding us and making yeah. sure we, uh, uh, Emily's done a great job of shepherding it. And uh, I think uh, it's been uh, fun for me, I can tell you. I've learned a lot and, I, uh, and I've also got to meet some great people along the way. So. Yeah out there too so anyway thanks for coming enjoy the wine young man we're gonna follow you home and uh see you guys next time All right. thank you very much <laughs>